Thank you, John, and welcome everyone to Esoteric Foundations of Astrology According to Theosophy. As the title points out, we are going to explore astrology, uh, not in the traditional way, but trying to answer a question that is often asked by people who may be interested in astrology but don't understand how it could work. The question is, how can planets, which are physical astronomical bodies uh, many miles away from the Earth, affect our lives? By what means? What's the causal link between these bodies going around the sun and the way that I feel, the way that I think, the things that happen in my life, etc. And this is often a criticism of astrology, why, uh, or one of the reasons perhaps, why science doesn't take astrology seriously. Now in the theosophical tradition, it is stated very clearly that it is not the physical planets that cause anything, any effect on us, but that the physical planets fulfill a function of indicating certain changes that happen on a different uh, dimension in the universe. Let's put it that way. Uh, just as the, if we look at a clock, we see that uh, there is a movement there, a cyclic movement, in the hands of the clock and time passes um, along with that movement that we see in the clock. But we don't think that the movement of the clock is making time pass. It is actually the opposite. Uh, time passes and we follow, we indicate that, that uh, passage of time by the movement in the clock. So the theosophical tradition says that uh, similarly, the movement of the physical planets are just indicators of cycles of activity that take place on different planes or dimensions of the universe. And because there is a connection between the cosmos and human beings, then there is this uh, causal link between this activity that we are going to explore, uh, uh, indicated by the movement of astronomical bodies and our own psychological and physical activity. Now, it is important to understand this for several reasons. One of them is that when, uh, for example, Blavatsky said, without having a thorough, uh, without having a thorough understanding of astrology, it becomes a superstition. And this is because when we do, don't understand the, the causal link between two events, uh, we may fall into what is called magical thinking. It is not different from, you know, early human beings thinking that the thunder in the sky was being produced by a god that was sitting on the clouds. And that's obviously not the case, and that is a superstition. So thinking that the planets can produce something on non-physical levels in our cells without understanding what that means is also a superstition. And also, if we understand properly what kind of influence we receive from the, this kind of cosmic activity, then we are in a much better position to deal with it. Uh, some people may read into astrology some kind of fatalism. If they believe in astrology, if they saw that certain things that were predicted to happen did happen, then they may have this feeling uh, that there is a fate that we cannot change, and therefore we are the slaves of this external force. Now, if we understand properly the kind of influences that uh, are playing upon us, then that is not uh, that that um, point of view is not supported by this deeper understanding. 
Now, in order to understand this, we have to explore the constitution of human beings and the cosmos itself. So I will have to review some theosophical teachings for those who may not be familiar with, with this. Um, and we have to actually begin to examine the very creation or manifestation, as we say, of the cosmos, according to the theosophical view. So the idea uh, that we are going to explore is this idea that of seven rays of manifestation. Perhaps some of you have heard about this. Uh, uh, there are several traditions talking about the seven rays. This was originally taught uh, within the theosophical tradition by the early theosophists Blavatsky and the contemporary occultist uh, Suba Rao. And then later theosophists developed this, this subject more. But in other traditions, the, uh, there is also a development of this, a later development. I'm going to be talking about this from the point of view of the theosophical tradition. Now, the idea is that everything that exists in our solar system, all the matter, all the life, all the consciousness that, um, that is expressing and animates mineral forms, plants, animals, and human beings come from a single source, which we call the solar logos. The word logos means it's a Greek word that has several meanings. Some of them are order. This is the source of order, reason, uh, word, as in the gospel of uh, St. John that was written originally in Greek, uh, when it says in the beginning was the word, uh, the, the word used for that is logos. In the beginning was the logos and the logos was with God, etc. This is called solar logos because the sun is uh, its main physical manifestation. Of course, the logos in the theosophical view is a, a, a non-anthropomorphic deity. Anthropomorphic means that when we think of something as having a human form, uh, the logos is the source of the, the universal mind, the source of everything, as I said, but it's not an entity separate from the rest. Uh, everything develops within the, let's call it the, the sphere of consciousness or the aura of the logos. Uh, so everything in the solar system is a manifestation of these logos. But on the physical plane, the sun is a special manifestation. It's like the heart of the logos. And we know that on the physical plane, the heart is the source of life uh, for, for every form of life in the system. Uh, it all begins with the energy that is coming from the sun. So we have... First, the solar logos. It's not the sun. The sun is just a physical manifestation. We are talking about, as I said, a, a cosmic mind. And from it comes everything that will constitute a, a solar system. Uh, however, the solar logos is like the synthesis of all the forces that are going to manifest and differentiate and create variety. It is the single source of all that variety. So in terms of light, we could say that the solar logos is like the white light, which as it goes through a prism, it differentiates in the seven main colors. And this is exactly, allegorically speaking, what happens in our solar system too. Uh, the logos manifests first seven rays of consciousness and matter and energy, in the theosophical tradition, matter, energy, consciousness are three aspects of the same, the same principle. All types of matter have some kind of consciousness. Now, when we say consciousness, we don't mean human consciousness or human-like consciousness. The atom has a consciousness of its own, which is, of course, very different from consciousness in a human being. Uh, minerals have a kind of consciousness. They can respond to the environment in the way that the constitution of a mineral allows it, a very simple way. Uh, then as the structure becomes more complex, 
in plants, for example, there is a, a finer response to the environment. There is more degrees of freedom, let's say, in, in a plant to respond to the environment than in a mineral. And then as the forms evolve, animals, humans, uh, also the manifestation of consciousness becomes more complex and rich. But all this matter, consciousness, life, is one single principle manifesting in different ways. So at the beginning, beginning of the cosmos, the solar logos manifests itself in seven main ways, which are symbolized by the seven colors uh, in the rainbow. These seven rays will um, are the, the source uh, or the, the more differentiated source of everything. Now at the head of e each of these seven rays, there are uh, seven um, very high celestial beings. You know, in the Bible, um, it is sometimes the Bible talks about these seven great angels that are uh, facing the throne of God. Uh, remember that since in the theosophical tradition, everything has consciousness, the, the manifestation, the first manifestation of, of the logos are seven kinds of substances, seven kinds of forces, but also seven kinds of uh, consciousness. And this consciousness, because they are directly emanated from the universal mind, that is the logos, are very high consciousness. They are the highest in the system, uh, apart from the logos that interpenetrates everything. So these uh, seven beings in the theosophical tradition are called either seven logois. Uh, logoi is the plural of logos. Uh, they are minor logois compared to the solar logos or seven planetary spirits, which we are going to explore in more detail. Uh, now, we have in our cosmos, according to theosophical teachings, several planes of manifestation. We are all aware of the physical plane in which matter is, uh, is manifested in this concrete dense form that we can perceive with our five senses. But we also have um, different planes that are subtler that, you know, they, they have matter, but the matter is far subtler than the physical and therefore our senses cannot um, perceive them. The, they have um, a kind of energy and a, a certain kind of consciousness is, is possible on each of these. For example, the astral plane that you see there, the consciousness on the astral plane is uh, very much linked with uh, emotions. The consciousness on the mental plane is linked with um, mental activity and understanding, etc. And the, the matter on each of these planes is constituted by the substance that is coming from these seven planetary spirits. I'm saying coming from, but it's not that they are emanating something out of themselves. Uh, perhaps, you know, you have to keep in mind that it's difficult to explain in physical world, in words, uh, words that were created to explain the physical world. Uh, it's difficult to use those words to talk about realities on higher planes where separation is not so sharp, uh, where the conditions are so different. But perhaps we could say that all these planes are actually parts in the aura of each of these seven planetary spirits. Within the aura of these great angelic beings, uh, which are the first manifestations in the, in the cosmos, um, with the substance and, and the consciousness and the energy that belong to the, the aura of these beings, forms of life are generated. It is not too different, perhaps, as in the case of a human being. We, we are constituted by cells. The cells have their own kind of consciousness. There are also bacteria, parasites, etc., living in our cells. So we also are a, a, a microcosm. Within us, 
there are forms of life that are evolving and they are all evolving within our, our own being. So all these planes are constituted, made of the, the substance, the consciousness and the energy of these divine beings. And you can see that there is a presence of all of them on each plane. This uh, original substance from which different organisms will take form is technically called in, theoso in the theosophical tradition, elemental essence, yeah. elemental from element. Uh, these are the, the original elements, so to say, that constitute each of the planes. And uh, since, since matter consciousness um, organizes itself in, in forms, uh, all the beings that are, um, are developed, that evolve during the evolution of a solar system, will be made of the substance of one or another of these um, planetary spirits. So let's look a little more closely to, uh, to our case, the case of human beings. In the theosophical tradition, our true nature, our higher nature, what we are in essence are divine sparks, sparks emanated from the logos, the logos as a, as a fire and sparks coming out of that fire which eventually will become fires in themselves. Uh, the, the sparks will become logos, you know, in eons in the future because of the process of evolution. But at the beginning of our evolution, all these sparks are emanated and they are emanated through one or another of these seven rays. So that we have some monads that belong to, let's call it the red ray, uh, and other monads may mm, belong to the green ray. This depends on through what planetary spirit the monads were emanated. So then we can classify the divine spark. So I am mentioning the word monad because this is the technical word used in theosophy for divine spark. Monad means uh, unit. So these are our divine units. So the monads or divine sparks in humanity, the whole of humanity can be uh, grouped in seven uh, large groups of monads according to how they manifested at the beginning of evolution uh, through this ray or that ray. And as, as we are going to see, the emanation through one ray or the other will give a certain quality to the monad that is different from the qualities of monads emanated through other rays. Now, how is this connected to our subject of astrology? Well, it is connected because each planetary spirit, just as the, the logos has a physical manifestation, each planetary spirit has also a physical manifestation that is what we call a planet. Uh, the ancients would talk about the seven sacred planets, not because they didn't know that there were other planets in the solar system, but because these seven particular planets are uh, the manifestations of these seven planetary spirits. All the other planets, they fall within one or the other of these rays. So, for example, in the red ray that we are um, uh, showing here, Mars is the physical planet, the physical manifestation of the planetary spirit that is at the head of the, the red ray, for example. Now, you see, of course, in astrology, we have the sun and the moon as uh, being treated as planets, and we know they are not planets. And also we said that the sun was the manifestation of the solar logos. And here the sun is shown as the manifestation of the planetary spirit at the head of the orange ray. This is because in the theosophical, according to theosophical teachings, the sun and the moon uh, are really uh, symbols for two planets that at this point are not physical. The sun is 
really a symbol for a, an intramercurial planet. That means a planet that is closer to the sun than Mercury, which uh, was called uh, Vulcan. And because it is so close to the sun, um, in astrology, wherever the sun is, uh, Vulcan is right there. So since Vulcan cannot be seen, we use the sun uh, indicating the position of Vulcan. Similarly with the moon, the moon is actually representing a, an invisible planet that is, Blavatsky said, behind the moon, whatever that means. She didn't explain this further. But uh, it is an invisible planet that is close enough to the moon and the movement of the moon so that we can use the moon uh, as uh, the indicator of the activity of this planet. So we have here that um, all these, these manifestations through the seven rays uh, are connected, will be connected, to one or another of these planets, because these planets are direct expressions on the physical plane uh, of the heads of each of the rays. So that, as I said before, as we see in a clock, the movement of the hands of the clock as indicating time, when we see the movement of one of these planets, that movement is indicating certain cycles of activity in the consciousness of these planetary spirits. So there is a, a cyclic activity in the consciousness and in the substance of each of these planetary spirits, which is indicated by the movement of the planets. And this also means that each planet is far more than this physical aggregation of matter. Uh, each planet has a spirit just as each physical body in us has a spirit, our mona. So each planet has a spirit, the planetary spirit, which is recognized in several ancient traditions. For example, the Greeks called the planetary spirit of our Earth Gaia. So each of the planets have their own planetary spirit. But as I said, these seven sacred planets are the manifestations of the heads of the rays. All the other planetary spirits are associated to one ray or the other. And this is why Blavatsky said, as each of these hierarchies is the ruler of one of the sacred planets, it will easily be understood how astrology came into existence. This is what we are going to, to explore. Uh, each of our monads came through one of the seven planetary spirits, and the monads are colored then by the respective uh, ray. And each of these rays have a specific characteristic. Uh, in a human being, for example, it is said that uh, one of the rays, when we are talking about more of psychological characteristics, uh, one of the rays will um, has the, the quality of will and power. Another ray has the quality of love and compassion. Another ray has the quality of understanding and activity, etc. Uh, now, this is how the, the quality of a ray manifests psychologically. We have also crystals that belong to one ray or the other. And of course, the the way the ray manifests in crystals is in, in a different way. It's not that one crystal has will, another crystal has love, but there is a correlation. There are some crystals that may be good to um, you know, help us at the level of our will, other crystals that may help with their vibrations at the level of love and compassion, simply because these crystals were manifested by the same ray than, uh, for example, La Armonad in particular, or, or some other qualities. Now, we are not simply the manifestation, uh, what we show in ourselves, uh, in our personalities, is not simply the manifestations of the qualities of our monads, our divine sparks. Actually, the divine sparks in the majority of humanity is quite buried um, beneath matter, let's say, and um, the, the divine spark has 
normally, you know, in humanity as a whole, uh, at this point in evolution, has very little influence on the personality. As we will see in this talk, there are different levels of influence and different levels of, of qualities or temperaments, as they are called, in each one of us. Uh, and therefore, we are influenced by different planetary spirits on different levels. Uh, but this race, uh, the, the main point here is that this race um, are everything manifests through this race. And each of these race has a particular quality uh, for the different kingdoms. There are plants that belong to one ray or the other, animals that belong to one ray or the other, etc. So suppose that our monad was emanated from the logos through the uh, indigo ray or through the, the ray that the planetary spirit of Venus uh, rules. So let us call it the Venus ray. Then this is our primary temperament that I was uh, referring to before. Uh, the primary temperament of our divine spark is the temperament that belongs to the Venus ray. Uh, if our monad can manifest through our personality, it would manifest with the qualities that are assigned or that are part of the Venus ray, for example. Um, it, remember that we are talking about that the substance of our divine spark uh, is part of the substance of this ray. We are developing within the very aura of the, the planetary spirits. And this understanding is important uh, to see how the astrological influences uh, take place. So now we have to look at another concept. We have to look at a couple of more concepts before we examine how uh, astrology, the foundations of astrology from the perspective that I am presenting. The other teaching is this of the planes of nature. We saw that there are several planes of nature in addition to the physical plane. Now these planes, all these planes are made of substance, as I said. And each plane has its own kind of atom. Now the word atom means indivisible. It means the ultimate particle, the particle that cannot be broken down in smaller pieces. The, in science, we have the concept of atom, but technically speaking, it's a misnomer because we know that the atom is divisible. Science, uh, this word was used by Greek philosophers. And when scientists discovered the, what we call atom today, they thought that that was the ultimate physical particle that could not be divided. And for some time, for several years, um, they thought that the atom was just like a little billiard ball of matter that could not be further divided. Uh, with more advance throughout the most of the uh, 19th century, they thought of atoms in this way. In the 20th century or by the end of the 19th century, they began to realize that the atoms could be divided. But of course, they couldn't change the name any longer. Um, now, when we talk about atoms here, we are talking about that ultimate particle which cannot be divided any further. So every plane has uh, its own uh, real atom, ultimate particle, which combines in different ways to generate what is called different subplanes of this uh, of, of this plane, and so that all the substance that we have on any given plane is a combination of these ultimate atoms. And then on each plane, each plane has a different kind of atom, which is symbolized here by the different geometrical figures. So we have a specific kind of atom on each plane. And this is what gives the matter of the plane its particular quality. And the kind of consciousness that can be expressed on that plane also its particular quality, depending on the kind of atom is the kind of uh, matter and body, and the body limits 
the, the kind of consciousness that can be expressed uh, there. Now, not only does each of these planes have its own type of atom, but there is on each plane the seven colors of these, or these atoms are in seven colors, you know, color in, in an allegorical way. We are not using the word color uh, in the sense that if you look at the atom, they will have that color. The color here represents a particular kind of vibration, let's say. Uh, so on each of these planes, we have atoms that belong to each of the seven rays, uh, because as we saw, the substance of the planes uh, um, come from all the seven rays. So we have all these atoms and therefore, you know, all the, the combinations uh, of atoms that can be made with mm, the, the, the substance coming from any of these rays. So we have a representative of the seven rays uh, on each plane. And this leads us to what we need to um, what is important for our subject, that is the concept of permanent atoms. So at the very beginning of evolution, our divine spark, let's take the example that uh, we gave uh, recently, the, uh, let's suppose a monad or divine spark that emanated through the Venus ray. That is our primary temperament. Now, the monad, in order to evolve, has to create a body on each of the planes. You know, if we don't have a physical body, when we die, uh, we don't have a physical body any longer, we cannot experience the physical plane. We still exist as a center of consciousness, but we don't have means to express ourselves on the physical plane. The same with each plane. We need a vehicle of expression, a vehicle of consciousness on each plane. And as evolution proceeds, the divine spark evolves, and also the matter that is being used evolves. At the beginning of evolution, the, um, the matter on each plane uh, is, relatively speaking, very unresponsive of the spiritual. It's very material. And as evolution proceeds, matter begins to be more and more sensitive to the spiritual. Uh, because of all the experience that matter goes through in its association with the monad. Now, uh, in each incarnation, for evolution to take place, each incarnation, the bodies that the monad forms for each life, for each incarnation, um, has to, to be a little better than the previous one, depending on the, let's call it, the efforts of the monad. If the monad could influence matter to a larger degree, then it has produced an evolution in those, in those atoms that made them more sensitive to the spiritual. But then after life, the body dissolves. And then when the monad has to create a new body, how does the monad bring the kind of atoms the, or atoms with the same vibration that it had produced in the previous incarnation? If the monad has to start over, then it has to start you know, pressing again on matter, trying to make it more receptive to the spiritual. So the way that nature has is that at the uh, beginning of evolution, the monad associates permanently to, uh, to itself a set of atoms on each plane, which are called permanent atoms, which are never let go of. When the bodies dissolve, Everything goes back to nature on each plane, but this one atom on each plane is retained by the monad. And this atom retains vibrationally, let's say the vibration of this atom uh, retains the degree of evolution that that monad has produced on matter up to that point. So that when the new incarnation comes, this permanent atom begins to vibrate and attract similar atoms, atoms that have a similar vibration to form the new bodies that this monad is going to use in that new incarnation. So in a certain sense, these permanent atoms are like the DNA, in a way, of the different bodies, you know, allegorically speaking. 
Now, what is important for, or, or let me say first, so the all the bodies, you know, we in the theosophical tradition, just as there are several, several planes, there are several bodies, as I explained. We have the physical body. There is also an astral body that forms around the astral atom. You see, you have the star there representing the astral permanent atom. And uh, when a new incarnation um, begins, the, a new astral body is created around that uh, astral permanent atom. Then there is a mental body, which is made of the lower subplanes of the mental plane. Here, there is not technically, there is no permanent atom there because uh, on the lower subplanes, there are no atoms available. Um, the, the, the mental body is not made of atoms, it's made of combinations of them. But the monad, I don't want to go too much into detail uh, into this, but uh, just for you to, to see the logic of this, the monad retains in that case, a unit, uh, a combination that is available on the, the highest of these lower subplanes, uh, which mm, uh, fulfills the function of a, a permanent atom. So there is a mental body built around that uh, unit, that permanent unit. And then there is a causal body around the uh, mental permanent atom. The causal body is the body of a reincarnating soul. Uh, in each incarnation, physical, emotional, and mental bodies are dissolved. New ones are created. The causal body remains with us, the same causal body evolving, remains with us for most of our evolution. Toward the end of our evolution, uh, we develop higher bodies on the intuitional and nirvanic planes, which um, and our consciousness begins to work more on those planes. In any case, what is important for us now is that these atoms, like anything else, must belong to one or another of the seven rays, because everything that is available in a system is avail available through these seven planes. Now, normally at the beginning of evolution, remember these atoms are chosen by the monad at the beginning of evolution and they are not changed. And the monad normally chooses, or uh, well, I would say always chooses atoms of the same ray for so that all the different bodies vibrate or has have the same kind of quality, otherwise it would be too chaotic. Sometimes the monad choose atoms that belong to the same ray of the monad. In this case, it would be the Venus ray or the indigo ray. Most of the times the monad chooses atoms belonging to a different ray so that this gives um, more richness to the, the manifestation of the monad. So let's suppose this monad creates a permanent atom or appropriates permanent atoms from the green ray, the ray that is ruled by the planetary spirit of Saturn. That would mean that uh, this is the, the secondary temperament of a human being. The primary is the one that comes from our divine spark. The secondary temperament is the one that comes from these permanent atoms, which are the ones that uh, generate our bodies. So in theory, our bodies would all belong to the, the same particular ray, and that's our secondary element. Now, the last thing that we have to examine before uh, going into the, the, how the influences work is that I said in theory, because something else happens in our process of evolution, and this is that our own actions, our own thoughts, our interests, um, you know, everything, all the activity that we, we have in each incarnation, it produces karmic causes that will have a say in the next incarnation in the building of all of our bodies. So these karmic forces interfere in the creation of the bodies and sometimes override, and sometimes it may over, they may override completely the influence of the permanent atom, or other times to some degree. But the, the final result of this is that, in fact, in our lower 
physical bodies, the mental, the emotional, and the physical, we end up having bodies that ha have elemental essence, that have a substance from all the race. So in each of, of us, uh, you know, on a, a, at the level of our personal manifestation, we have substance from all the race in different proportions, depending on how much the monad can impress its influence from its own ray on, on a human being, how much the permanent atom can impose its own influence on the creation of the bodies, and then whatever karma allows uh, or, or brings in the new incarnation, karma that, of course, we generated previously. And this is what is called our tertiary character or temperament. So to summarize this, we have the primary temperament that comes from the monad. This would, you know, in this case would be in the Venus ray. Then we have the secondary temperament determined by the permanent atoms. And then we have the tertiary temperament that is a composite of all the colors in different proportions brought by karma. So that we, as physical manifestations are the result of the combination of these three temperaments. Uh, the tertiary temperament changes from incarnation to incarnation. The other two are the same throughout the whole of our evolution because the monad doesn't change and the permanent atoms don't change from incarnation to incarnation. So when we draw an astral chart or a natal chart, what we are seeing there is a map of the proportion of substance from these different planetary spirits that constitute our particular personality. If, for example, one of the planets is dominant, let's say Jupiter is dominant, or well, Jupiter is not one of the head of the planets. So let's say Mars, Mars is uh, dominant, then that means that the, the substance of, of the ray that Mars is, the, or, or the planetary spirit of Mars is the head, that that substance is dominant in us. Uh, in the case of Jupiter, Jupiter belongs to one of the rays, it's a, it's a further manifestation of one of the seven rays. So that would mean that um, the, the substance from that particular ray is dominant in our, in our uh, constitution. And the relationships, the, the angles, what is called the aspects between these different uh, planets, we'll also talk about uh, what kind of vibration, because within the substance of each uh, planetary spirit, there are different levels of vibration, different rates of vibration. So the angles are showing uh, how uh, sympathetic, uh, how harmonious the vibration between uh, the, the substance from one ray and, and the other is in us or not. So the, the natal chart is a, a map for the constitution in, uh, in the way that I am explaining of the substance that comes from each of the rays. So let us now look at the astrological influences. This, I'm going to read some quotes from some theosophists. This is from Jeffrey Hudson. He was a, a clairvoyant, um, an occultist, uh, meaning a person that was able to be aware, to use, uh, to, to research in consciously into all these hidden forces on the different planes of nature. And he says, a veritable portion of the regions of planets, he's referring to the planetary spirits, planets, suns, and zodiac forms part of the building material of our bodies. We have seen that. There is elemental essence in the causal, mental, astral, and physical bodies of men, which is vibrating at the rate of and directly represents each of these beings. But it is not a matter of vibrational rate only. It is also a fact that the substance of these mighty intelligences is embedded in the structure of the bodies. Blavatsky would frequently say that 
within a human being uh, is present all the hierarchies of celestial beings of the heavens. Um, because all celestial, there are manifestations of different celestial beings through each of these rays too. So in the very substance of our bodies and the rate of vibration, uh, we have the presence of these celestial beings. This is why Blavatsky and all theosophists say that uh, a human being is a microcosm, is a miniature replica of the bigger cosmos, in this case, our solar system. And he continues, the planetary elements or qualities exist as the materials of which all the bodies are built. Certain of them preponderate, but all are present in each body. So even though all are present, some of them will be more preponderant, as he says, which I explained this would be seen by what planets in the, in, in the natal chart are stronger in that particular person. And then uh, he continues, you may think of them almost as instincts, natural powers of responsiveness, all subconscious. Uh, in, in most of us, all these influences, why do we respond to a situation, uh, you know, to a challenge, let's say, by using uh, strength and will and power? or by means of love and compassion, or trying to understand the situation, or with devotion, etc. And those tendencies, which in most of us are just instinctive and subconscious, are the result of the kind of substance that is composing our different bodies. Uh, what kind of the, the influence that is coming from these different rays. As we grow in self-knowledge and in self-mastery, we begin to be aware of all these different influences. And of course, astrology can be very useful for us to start learning about ourselves, for us to start developing self-knowledge, because we, we can see that these planets are more uh, dominant, that these expre different expressions are harmonious or inharmonious. And that can be the first step for us to start actually observing how these influences work in ourselves. And as we begin to be aware of them, then we acquire uh, far more freedom in how we relate to those influences, as we are going to see at the end. And he says, think of a continued interchange back and forth by radio beams between you and the planets and the signs. So of course, this interchange back and forth it's not necessarily physical. There is an interchange physically, the light that is being reflected, gamma rays, X-rays, you know, but all that is at the level of the physical plane. Uh, there is also an interchange of energy at the, at the emotional level, on the astral plane, at the mental level, on the mental plane, at the spiritual levels, etc. And there is a constant interchange and influence uh, from the planetary spirits uh, on humanity and on everything else on Earth. Now, talking about this tertiary temperament, which is our personality, what is reflected in the natal chart, Annie Besant said, according to this tertiary temperament will be the time of the birth of the body. The body must be born into the world at a time when the physical planetary influences are suitable to its third temperament. And it is thus born under its astrological star. Needless to say, it is not the star that imposes the temperament, but the temperament that fixes the time of birth under the star. This is based on a concept that we are going to explore uh, next, that the, uh, as we said, the movement of the planets indicate cycles of activities, activity in the consciousness of the planetary spirits. So at any given moment, the influence of one planetary spirit may be stronger than the other. And the soul waits for the time when the, the influences are just right, according to the previous karma generated, to be born 
so that the bodies are made in the right proportion with the right kind of vibrations, let's say. This, of course, is very complicated. We are simplifying all this. We cannot really understand all the complications of this. This is why in the theosophical tradition, it is said that souls are guided by uh, celestial beings that are karmic uh, angels, let's say, are guided when to incarnate, when the right conditions are present, because this is very complicated. A soul, only a, a, as the soul attains enlightenment, the soul can choose when and where to be born. Um, otherwise, we choose indirectly. We choose when to be born by and how, in what condition, by the karma we generate. But we are guided by these angel karmic angels, let's say, uh, so that we are born exactly in the right conditions with the kind of uh, astrological influences that we need to proceed in our evolutionary journey uh, according to the karma generated. So she says, Here, herein lies the explanation of the correspondences between stars or the stars angel, the star angels. Uh, so we could say the correspondences between the planets or rather the planetary spirits, that is to say, and characters and the usefulness for educational purposes of a skillfully and carefully drawn horoscope as a guide to the personal temperament of a child. That personal temperament would be the tertiary temperament, the one that manifests uh, on the physical plane. So let Peter explains a little about this, um, this idea of, of the cycles. Um, but before that, he says, for example, every astral form, our astral body, you know, built with matter from the astral plane, every astral form is built out of these seven. And according to the preponderance of one or other of these types of elemental essence, in their astral bodies, people may be arranged under planets, as is done by the astrologer, who speaks of a Venus person or a Mars person, a Jupiter person, and so on. Each of these centers, the planetary spirits, has a sort of orderly periodical change or motion of its own, corresponding, perhaps on some infinitely higher level, to the regular beating of the physical human heart. But since these periodic change, changes in the different hierarchies of celestial beings are much more rapid than in others, a curious and complicated series of effects is produced. The movement of the physical planets in their relation to one another furnishes a clue to the arrangement of these great spheres at any given moment. So to simplify, the consciousness of each planetary spirit goes through cyclic uh, activities or periods of activity and, and different aspects of its activity. And those cycles are different for each planetary spirit. And the, the length of these cycles are reflected by the movement of the physical planets. So as Ledbetter says, because all these cycles are different, we have all this complicated interaction between the planets that is different at each moment. And that is reflected in the natal chart. So he says, the slightest alteration of any kind in the condition of these great star angels, these planetary spirits, instantly is instantly reflected in some way or other in all the matter of the corresponding type that is in the elema, elemental essence, both in man and around him. So remember that the, the planes, the different planes of nature and our different bodies are made of the substance of these planetary spirits. So when there is a change in consciousness in the planetary spirit, that is reflected in the substance on each plane and, and that substance that we may have in our particular bodies. And this is how we how the connection uh, happens between what we see the motion of a planet and our inner um, activity, psychological, spiritual, emotional, etc. It is because 
that the, the activity in the planetary spirits is reflected in the, the substance, the elemental essence everywhere. And because we are made of that elemental essence, we feel that influence, we feel that effect. And he gives an example, a certain change, for example, uh, may produce unusual ex excitation of any of the classes of that essence or a sudden increase in its activity. Such activity may must undoubtedly affect to some extent either a person's emotions or mind or both. And he says, because of the varieties of essence entering into the composition of their bodies, it is also obvious that these influences must work differently on different people. And the extent to which any particular person is affected depends upon the proportion of the type of matter influenced which he happens to have. That is to say, by the very composition of our bodies, some of us are more susceptible to one influence, some to another. So the idea here is that Suppose that we have um, our bodies, let's say our emotional body is composed of a, a large proportion of matter coming from the planetary spirit of Mars. So when the pla the, in the cycle of activity, the consciousness of the planetary spirit of Mars is, is very active, then that will activate all the matter that is coming from that planetary spirit so that people who have a large proportion of that matter in their emotional body will feel their passions, their emotions, their energy increased. Uh, on the, if there is a person that has a large proportion, that increase will be felt strongly. In a person that has little matter, let's say in the emotional body from that, that ray, uh, the increase is not going to feel you know, very strongly. And the same with all these different planetary uh, influences. Now, what theosophists draw from here, from here, that I don't have time to present it just because the, you know, in one hour I, I just wanted to give you the, the fundamental principles. But what comes from this is that every time we feel something as a result of uh, the, the change in activity in all these planetary spirits, this is something that is happening external to us. In no way can this affect our willpower. Of course, if there is an influence that is playing upon ourselves very strongly, it may make difficult for our, our willpower not to fall in, in that kind of activity. Suppose that our irritability is increased or our, our you know, desires are increased, or our, our need to be alone is increased. If we have very little self-knowledge, we don't even realize this and we just go along with it. Having self-knowledge, we begin to realize, wait, this kind of influence is playing on myself. And realizing that there is the possibility of choice. When we are unaware of that, there is no possibility of choice. Uh, as we become aware, then there is the possibility of choice. And then it depends on how, how much we have, um, you know, work in, at the level of self-mastery, how much um, personal will we have, that will uh, determine whether we can resist an influence that which manifestation at this point would be inappropriate, unhealthy, you know, or not positive, how much we can resist that or not. As we go on with the spiritual practice and we develop um, more self-knowledge, more self-mastery, we begin to be able to realize these different uh, influences, to, to become aware of them, and know that they are just external influences that I can choose what to do. They are not uh, an unavoidable fate. It may work as an avoidable fate for those who have very little self-awareness and very little self-power. So whatever influences are there will produce, will make the person act in this way. 
but it doesn't need to be that way. If we work on ourselves and we develop self-mastery and self-knowledge, then little by little we can become uh, really the masters of our destiny. And we will work in certain directions when the influences are helping to work in that direction. Uh, when they are not, uh, we may decide to wait, or if it is necessary, the action, we will do it anyway, knowing that we can do it, even if we don't feel like doing it, uh, because all those feelings and thoughts are external to us. And this is the key, as I was saying, to understanding how to relate to astrology from a very different point of view. When you see your uh, natal chart, you are just seeing external influences, uh, pressures on you, but you remain always free to do your best and to choose according to you know, your self-knowledge and self-mastery. So this is, um, you know, in a, in a very brief way, uh, a, a, a sample of how the theosophical view on the constitution of human beings and the cosmos can help illuminate our understanding of astrology. I hope this is helpful and thank you for your attention.